it will have more weight and support than if it is not supported by the cabinet and is only supported by the PM. Although this is a rather extreme example, it just goes to highlight that to some people, the cabinet collectively, when they back a decision, has more weight than the prime minister alone. Furthermore, the cabinet involves more specific knowledge than the prime minister. Heads of departments become better specialised within their own field, given that their job almost every day involves the running of that department. And as such, it makes sense to some people for all of the members of government in the cabinet to be present at important meetings, so that the impact upon every important government department can be considered and can be better explained by cabinet ministers than just the prime minister themselves. Some would also point in history to the power that large-scale cabinet resignations can have to show that the cabinet can hold power. Blair's reputation revolving the Iraq war was even further damaged by a number of large-scale resignations directly before they voted on the issue of going to war. For example, the most famous one is the resignation of Robin Cook, and it shows that government ministers are important you can't simply get rid of every single government minister, especially if they are very popular and very well supported within the party, and the Prime Minister is not as all powerful as they may like to be. The Cabinet can also be more powerful, essentially, when the government is in a minority. The Prime Minister lacks a department himself, and when they are weak, their power is extremely limited, best example being Theresa May. A collective Cabinet holds more weight within a minority government because they can force out the Prime Minister and they can change the way that the policy is directed. And when the entire cabinet supports a policy, it is more likely to gain support from other parties, even when they're in a minority government, than if it was just supported by the Prime Minister. And then finally, the cabinet consists of elected individuals. The Prime Minister is only one elected individual, and he is only elected, or she, is only elected by one constituency. And as such, the cabinet making de decisions ensures that there is more representation present than the one constituency which voted for the Prime Minister, when in fact they are the one who should be running the whole country. Moving on now to the other side. The cabinet-based system of government still exists, but some argue that the Prime Minister has had to take on more of a responsibility and take on more power in order for the government to operate more effectively. In the case of the EU, for example, some would say that David Cameron had to act more like a president than a prime minister because the approach to the EU required a single person who could be at the front of communications. If it were going through an entire cabinet, it would be far more problematic and a lot less efficient. Furthermore, the cabinet is less effective than the prime minister in acting quickly and decisively. And if every voice has to be heard and recognised, then it simply makes the government to some less effective and efficient. Some argue also that the power of government revolves around the Prime Minister, not the Cabinet. The Prime Minister is, normally, the most permanent minister present. Ministers can be reshuffled, they can resign over a single policy issue, and they can be sacked on a somewhat regular basis. Therefore, it is more stable to have the Prime Minister making decisions, because as long as their decisions aren't terrible and they don't lose the support of their party, they are there continually, and if the Cabinet is changing constantly, and it does often change, it can be more problematic, especially if a Minister is changing every few years often, they're not going to be as effective in their decision-making process. Furthermore, the growth of the number 10 office and the increased use of SPADs or special political advisers has narrowed the knowledge gap between the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. Furthermore, the Cabinet is often filled with people who have no prior experience in the type of department they run. Most Ministers for Defence, for Health, for Education have no experience in those sectors and their decisions are influenced by civil servants and political advisers. And as such, some would argue that the Prime Minister can obtain the same advice that they may receive from a Cabinet member more quickly without relying on the Cabinet. Furthermore, often, at times, many departments are not impacted by decisions. A change to the education service is going to have very little direct impact on, for example, the Secretary of State for Defence. 
and as such, it is often due to the waste of time to have every member of the cabinet present when making a decision. There's no point having them there just for the sake of it. Instead, some argue that it makes more sense to have the Prime Minister and just a handful or even one singular minister to make decisions when it's regarding their department only. Furthermore, in the nature of UK politics, the Cabinet often simply votes with the Prime Minister or resigns. So, unless it's a really unpopular decision, in which case they probably wouldn't have got the support of their party anyway, the Cabinet are simply going to be filled with yes-men, as is the case with the way a Prime Minister fills the Cabinet mostly with their own supporters. There is not much point it being there to begin with. And then finally, most elections come down to the Prime Minister of a, or the leader of a party and their manifesto. The way general elections have been shaped and framed is around the individual leading the party, and voters often don't know or don't care about the cabinet beforehand and afterwards, and as such, some claim that the election is often a vote on the prime ministerial candidate, and therefore, if they win, the prime minister does indeed have a democratic mandate to enact what they want, compared to the cabinet who were not elected, but chosen by the prime minister who was elected. Moving on now to a comparison. On the question of knowledge, those supporting the cabinet would say that cabinet members have more specialist knowledge given that they run their own respective departments and only run that department. And as such, the cabinet should be more prevalent because there is more experience and more knowledge involved in the decision-making process. However, on the other side, they would say that advisors are present for everyone, the prime minister and the ministers, and as such, they have the same base of knowledge, and most of the time, ministers are inexperienced, and as such, given that it's either the Prime Minister receiving information from advisers, or the Cabinet receiving information from advisers, and then giving it to the Prime Minister, it is more effective to have the Prime Minister doing it instead. On the question of interdepartment relations, and how much decisions affect other departments, then those supporting the Cabinet would say that it makes more sense to have every cabinet member present to ensure that every voice is heard and if an impact has been overlooked it can be brought up by that respective minister. However those on the other side would say that the vast majority of the time most departments are simply not involved and it wastes time to have everyone present and have everyone heard when most of the time they're either going to be quiet or simply vote yes anyway. So again it comes down to this question of efficiency. Then on the question of backing of decisions and how important it is, those supporting the cabinet would say that it is, has more weight for a decision when it has the entire cabinet backing it. However, those supporting the prime ministerial side of this debate would say that the cabinet is backed, will back decisions rather, regardless of what happens, as long as it's not a terrible policy, which is quite rare. It is merely a nominal support for something that will happen regardless, and as such, again, it's simply a waste of time to have the cabinet present and approving everything. Then, on the question of a minority government, those supporting the cabinet would say that having stronger cabinet power is important as it helps, essentially, the government to gain more support if it's got collective government backing rather than just a prime minister. However, those on the other side would say that in a minority government, it doesn't really matter regardless, and that Given first past the post, you're almost all the time going to be in a majority, as long as they don't screw up the election, Theresa May. Then, on the nature of the political system, those supporting the cabinet would say, essentially, that the cabinet is the historical system of the UK government. Point to this phrase again, primus inter paris. We are not a presidential system, we are a prime ministerial system, a ministerial form of government, and as such, it is in the constitution or the uncodified constitution, very complicated, I'll go into that in a future episode if I can be bothered, it's, um, it's in convention, it's constitutional convention, it's historical, essentially all of these factors add up to the fact that the UK system should be a cabinet system, not a presidential prime ministerial system. However, those on the other side would say that the PM is still first among equals, they do not command the same power as a president, and the events of recent history have required them to become more presidential and it is more efficient, and they are instead a presidential prime minister, which still acknowledges the existence of the cabinet. Then on the question of who is the one elected and who should be chosen from that election, those supporting the cabinet say that the prime minister 
is only one person elected in one constituency, and as such, more voices are needed to be present to ensure proper representation and legitimation of policy and decisions. However, those on the other side would say that the prime ministerial candidate dictates almost all the time the outcome of the election as an individual and given that they are the ones who decide on the manifesto. And as such, if a prime minister has won an election, they can claim a mandate and cabinet members are chosen by them. And as such, the PM is the one really in control here and should be the one having more of a say. Then on the question of stability, those supporting the cabinet would say that it is important to have all members of the cabinet backing decisions as it makes government more stable to involve more decision makers and can ensure that policies are not quickly rushed out which can then be rescinded and cause a lot of problems essentially with integrity. However with a cabinet things are done more properly and more effectively and as such it means that the government is going to be more stable. However those on the other side would say that the cabinet is inherently unstable. Cabinet ministers often resign and change. So you will either have yes men, at which point it's stable, but they simply support the Prime Minister anyway, or you have an unstable cabinet full of changing members which causes lots of problems, and as such, they should be bypassed in favour of the Prime Minister regardless. And then finally, a quick question on the power of resignations. Those supporting the cabinet would say that the cabinet holds power, and that when or if they all resign, they put pressure on the Prime Minister. However, those on the other side would say that, cab that resignations are rare, given that, again, you often fill with supporters. And it's only with weak prime ministers who have no choice but to put stronger cabinet members in that it occurs. And with a strong prime minister such as Blair, these resignations did not stop him. Overall, though, those who believe that the cabinet should hold more power than it currently does often point to the nature and makeup of the UK's constitutional history and the collective knowledge of ministers and the power of a total cabinet backing and essentially support this idea of a more thorough and if not inefficient a more thorough and detailed run through of decisions before they are made however those who support the prime minister having more power argue that the increased efficiency brought about by the prime minister being the one making decisions makes essentially the government more, more able to act and would question the actions of the cabinet anyway, as essentially just being it's either a yes-man cabinet, as what these people would take it to be, or it is simply just essentially a nominal tool to support policies that are already pre-decided. Ultimately, though, the way it looks, as long as the Prime Minister can command the respect of their party and win an election with a majority, they will hold the power, and the trajectory and the trajectory of UK political history recently has been one involving a declining relevance of the cabinet, which ultimately, especially with the actions of Boris Johnson, shows no sign of slowing down. But anyway, what do you think on this topic? And is there anything that I missed, got wrong, or could do better? And be sure to check back next Monday for an episode. I won't have time to do on a Friday, so see you on Monday for another episode. Anyway, thank you for listening, and I hope to see you all soon.